Can I start by thanking you very much indeed uh, for asking me along to this conference today. Um, it is a genuine pleasure for me to be here. It was Benjamin Franklin, one of um, America's founding fathers, who said, no nation was ever ruined by trade. That statement was spot on when Ben Franklin made it in the 18th century, and it's spot on today, the 21st century. Trade is Britain's economic livelihood and lifeblood. We're an island nation that's at our best when we're a trading nation. It's the very reason that this government is rebalancing our economy, moving Britain from a spend and borrow past to a make and sell future. But if you're going to trade, then our entrepreneurs have to connect. Connect with customers, connect with markets, and connect with other countries. In the modern world, that usually means a business trip and a seat on a plane, which also means a journey to an airport. And that's why air rail links matter so much. As the theme of your conference today rightly reminds us, these links are all about connecting for growth. Right now, growth is the word on everyone's lips. And that's hardly surprising in these testing times of a Eurozone crisis, a fragile global economy, and a record-breaking inherited debt in this country. Now, while there's still a long way to go, recent economic figures show that we are moving forward in the right direction, however slowly that may be. But I think there is a tendency in some quarters to talk about growth as though it's an abstract conception, something that's separate and standalone, something with a life force all of its very own. It's almost as though some commentators believe that growth will magically appear of its own volition, or that it'll come about if you say the word often enough or if you want it badly enough. Well, actually, out there in the real world, you can't talk or wish an economy into growth. You can't wave a wand and conjure up growth from thin air. And you can't sit back and wait for it to fall into your lap. Growth comes through hard slog. The competitive company and the skilled workforce. The investors and the innovators. The risk takers and the wealth creators. And yes, a supportive and empowering government. This is who and what drives growth. And, where there's, and that's where transport can play such a massive role by providing the vital connections that help to support and sustain growth. But the bottom line is, the government understands the overriding economic imperative of modernising our railways, our airports, and the links between them. Let me take each of those in turn. First, the railways. When we're engaged in a massive effort to renew and rebuild Britain's rail networks, and just this summer, we announced a new rail investment programme worth more than £9 billion. We're driving through landmark projects like Crossrail, Thameslink and the Northern Hub. We're going to electrify more than 850 miles of track compared to the 10 miles that was electrified by the last administration. And right across the country, we're making rail travel a whole lot better with new services and extra carriages, more seats and faster journeys. But our focus doesn't begin and end with the conventional railways. We also recognise the huge potential benefits of high-speed rail. But we know that our country and our economy need more than a high-speed line. They need a high-speed network. And that's exactly what we're going to build with HS2. A network that not only links London and Birmingham, but one that also speeds further north to Manchester and Leeds and possibly to Edinburgh and Glasgow. A network that not only opens up business opportunities at home, but one that also opens up business opportunities abroad by ensuring that passengers have an opportunity to connect up with the Channel Tunnel Rail Link and Heathrow Airport. HS2 will, of course, give people much quicker journey times. But it is so much more than simply a faster way to get from A to B. Because HS2 also means more capacity and better connected cities and regions, 
which in turn means that British businesses will be able to use it to exploit new markets, win new customers and attract new investment. HS2 will create and support tens of thousands of jobs and so help to power up the recovery and put people back to work. It will also help to deliver better life chances for millions of people by opening up access to employment opportunities and essential services like education and health. There's even a persuasive environmental case for HS2, and that's because it will offer people and businesses a high-speed, low-carbon alternative to short-haul flying and long-distance motoring. It's no exaggeration to say that HS2 will transform the way we live and work every bit as much as it transforms the way we travel. So make no mistake, the government's commitment to this game-changing project is full-on and flat-out. Let me now turn to the subject of airports. <coughs> Ever since the Wright brothers defied gravity in a box-shaped airplane made of spruce and covered in cotton, air travel has shrunk our world. But in doing so, it has also broadened our horizons, both personal and business. So airports have a front and centre role in keeping our country prosperous as well as keeping it connected. And that's why we're looking hard to make sure that the aviation sector continues to be successful. Take the Civil Aviation Bill, legislation that will improve the passenger experience by reforming the 25-year-old set of regulations that currently govern our main airports. We've consulted on our draft aviation policy framework, a framework that forms the basis for future sustainable aviation growth in the UK. And to increase reliability and reduce delays, we've been trailing operational freedoms at Heathrow. We're thinking ahead too. We need to make sure that the future of aviation in Britain is one where our airports are globally competitive and where you can connect to places all over the world. And I'm not talking about the future as just the next four or five years, but in terms of the next four or five decades. Aviation faces long-term challenges that require long-term solutions. And lots of people and lots of organisations have ideas about what those solutions should look like, including, I'm sure, many of you here today. So we've asked Sir Howard Davis to chair an independent airports commission to explore the evidence, consider the options, and make recommendations. Sir Howard has now named the members of his commission. Its terms of reference have been published. The job of work is underway. So let us be clear. The government is determined to build the consensus needed to deliver a lasting solution to this country's aviation needs. And we believe that the Airports Commission is the way to do precisely that. Now, if you take a look at this country's major airports, you'll probably notice any number of things that mark them out and make them unique. Look again, though, and you'll also see there are two things that they have in common. First, they act as global gateways to new markets and new customers, which means they're not just national transport assets, they're national economic aspect assets too. But second, they're set to become much easier places to get to and fly from. And that's because we're making real and lasting improvements to those crucial connections between the train and the plane. So let me highlight some of the new investments and modernizations that will achieve this. Electrification of the um, Midland Main Line improves access to Luton, while Valley's electrification improves access to Cardiff Airport. Electrification and capacity enhancements between Levington and Coventry enables more cross-country trains to run via Birmingham Airport. Extra platform capacity at Redhill means more opportunity for Gatwick services. In Greater Manchester, the Metrolink tram extension is due to open in 2016 and will take passengers from the city centre right into Manchester Airport. As part of the Northern Hub improvements, there'll be an extra platform at Manchester Airport, 
which will allow more and longer trains to serve that airport. Investment in the Audsall Cord and additional platforms at Piccadilly Station means that trains from Bradford, Halifax and Rochdale will be able to get to Manchester Airport for the very first time. A new half a billion pound rail link will give direct western access to Heathrow Airport and is expected to cut passenger journey times from the Thames Valley, the South West, Wales and the West Midlands by around half an hour. Once it's completed, Crossrail will provide new services linking Heathrow with the West End, the City of London and Canary Wharf. Thanks to Thameslink, Gatwick will get new direct services to destinations north of London, such as Cambridge, Stevenage and Welling. And not only will HS2 make it much easier for passengers from London and the South East to get to Birmingham Airport, but HS2 will also mean that people and businesses in the Midlands and the North of England can get improved access to Heathrow. I believe that this is an impressive list of projects and programmes. And if you add it all up, what you get are train services that work for rail passengers and air passengers as well. OK, when I made a speech, I'm always conscious of the words of um, Bill Clinton, who gave the following advice about public speaking. If you can't say what you want to say in less than 20 minutes or less, you should go away and write a book about it. Well, I'm sure that lovers of literature everywhere will be greatly relieved to know that I've no plans whatsoever to be an author, which means it's time for me to conclude my speech. But before I finish up, there's something I want you to know, and it's this. Connecting for growth isn't just at the top of your priority list. It's right at the heart of our transport policy. Seamless air rail journeys, better, faster, closer links between the station platform and the check-in desk. That's our vision, that's our ambition, and step by step, that's what we're delivering. Thank you very much indeed. And if anyone's got any questions, fire away.